Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm going to play the entirety of this video and then I'll go back, hit rewind, talk about things that are going on to better explain what's going on and talk about things that I think that were done right and or done wrong. Without further ado, here we go. There's nothing wrong with your volume. This is typical silence and body cam footage. There's usually a buffer uh, before the audio starts. I'm going with the Jungle Police Sport. The reason I'm getting out is your man. We're just doing a little bit of drug and addiction in the area. Um, we're just trying to get to know yeah, people also. There's a little bit of community policing, okay? Oh, no. Do what? Hey, right, come here. Come here. I can smell marijuana. Come here. Oh, you're lying. Come here. You're lying. Come here. No. Hey, come you here. Smell marijuana, come here. Bro. What are come you here, doing? Come here. Come here. No, you're come making here. me nervous. Stop. Come here. Down the ground. Stop. No. Please. Give me your hand. No. Give me your hand. I can't. Give me your hand. I cannot. No, Give I me can't do hand. nothing. Give me your hand. No. I got one fighting. Give me your hand. No! Quit you reaching for whatever you're fighting. reaching for. Give me your hand. <laughs> Let go. Right, Let go. I promise you, if that's a gun, it's not going to end well for you. I know. I know it's not. Give me your hand. Shots fired. Shots fired. I took one round to the leg. You bet you took one round to the Yo. leg. Yo. Two four. This is I'm 10 4. Nah, she's bleeding a little bit from the leg. 10 4, we've got EMF coming out of the stage. Uh, where's your stuff, mate? We are right in front of Ward. Uh, west of Warren. Small spruce. Oh. Oh. BMS is on the way. BMS is on the way. You guys just pass it, turn right right now. There you go. Yay. 
you start taking it off from me. Which direction? Well, he's on the ground now. Uh, I'm not sure if the bullet's still in my leg or not, but, uh, hey, so you guys sit down. You guys want to get off? Is it stopped? I don't know. It should be. Yeah, you're not pulsing. Come on. It's fine. It's good in pants. You sure? Yeah. I just don't want to be able to get around it. Maybe okay. Yeah, you're not there. The channel's patched. You're not there. Did it come through? Or? I don't think so. I think it's still in there. It's just a little bit. It's not very really bad. I'm going to tell you right now. Huh? Yeah. Shoot. Is it there? 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 Yeah. So no way, man. Yeah, stay, guys. Next stop, you're on the set. Go ahead and set up for everything. Huh? You good? Yeah, help me hobble over to the back. Well, no. What? You gotta go. Hey, you. Yeah. Set the fuck down. I'm trying. I'll be fine. I got you. It's just really tight. I got you. Good? Yeah, it's just really tight. No, you're not listening to that shit. I know, I know. Yeah, you're good. You Yeah, good. Fourteen is Yeah. Hey, uh, walking in the middle of the roadway. So, you know, you make contact. You can call the other man while I come from him. Uh, okay. Get calm, please. Get calm, same type. We need to get that ambulance to them. I do not know. I don't know. It's just him. Just him. It's just him. Just him. Hey, don't touch that. Yeah. Not another oh, yeah. No, no, no other guy? One guy? One guy. Hey. Just him. There is no other suspect. Just the one that's on scene here. Is that good? Is that good? Yeah, that was that first shit. Let's stop it. You're good though, man. Yeah. I really hope it's not fucking in there, though. I don't want to have surgery. Uh, Y'all clear. It be clear. Thank y'all. So, except the cop. Except the cop. Except the cop. Except the cop. Appreciate it. Oh, he was an arts man. Probably. I'll see you for the first. That first. Are you okay? Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. Is this the only place you hit, man? Do what? Is this the only place you hit? Yes. What was that with? Yeah, good, bro. Yeah, no, I just got one to the leg. Okay, well, fuck. My bad. Oh, I didn't. I didn't realize you were. I just thought you had like one little piece. You need to so go get some, though. Do what? You need to go get some. Yeah, though. I know. I know. You, you got a little thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Oh, this thing's tight as shit. This milk. Yeah. Let me bring the stretcher up here so you don't gotta walk. Sure. Um. Hey. Hey, run that in front of my car. Yeah, if you want to. Right. Yeah. Right. Can you walk? Yeah. Right. Here. Uh, where you parked at eight?
Yeah. I'm right up there. You want to put him in the mine of or no? No, mine's just right here. Okay. Wait, you want it? Thank you. 40 degrees. St. Yes. <laughs> yeah, my truck's right here with this. Just one minute. Hold off on that tape. Drop the tape. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and do that right now. What are we doing? You want me to go ahead and take his weapon? I don't know how often we have this on the charger. So, uh. I'm, I'm recording right are now. You running? Okay, we can yeah. do it. Can we still run while I'm over at 10 miles? You want me to cut it off while you're taking it Yeah, you can cut it off. You just need to get some. Alright, let's get into it. So let's go to the very beginning. All right. So what we have is just raw body cam footage. There is no um, community briefing type of video layout for this. I've looked at the Jonesboro Police Department's uh, YouTube page, and I think it was like two years ago, they had an officer involved shooting, and they had an actual community briefing kind of video where they had uh, a public speaker talking about the facts of the case, and then they presented the body cam footage. Other than that, there's really not a whole lot of videos on their page. Uh, definitely less than 50. Um, I don't even think they had more than 30 videos on their page. Um, they had the that one officer involved shooting video, and then they had a few videos of them releasing body cam footage from random incidents, um, but not a whole lot. Uh, this particular video, um, it is just raw body cam footage, and I don't know if um, they decided to do that because they don't have the funding or the ability to make nice videos anymore, or if they decided to push this out really fast um, because it would have taken time to record and edit an actual video presentation it takes it takes a lot of time <laughs> to edit videos and i don't do a whole lot of uh editing in my videos when it comes to the monday quarterback stuff obviously i just screen record uh things and uh talk so that can be a little bit easier to edit things out uh, when it comes to uh, multiple video recordings and you got to trim the videos, you know, join them together, etc. And then do multiple takes, that can take time. For example, this particular video I've done done <laughs> with the talking stuff, I've done done like four takes. Um, it can be, and that's just, just for me talking, like there's no uh, video camera, you know, feed stuff that I've got to, you know, do different angles on and do different editing, blah, blah, blah. It's just basically audio at this point. Um, so the minimal amount of editing that I do, although it's not that time consuming, it's still kind of time consuming. So actually producing an actual video uh, with a public speaker and doing multiple takes and, and all that, I can only imagine the amount of time that it takes to to produce a video like that. And I would say that it's it's possible that they decided to release just the body cam footage and not do an actual whole video thing because of that time frame involved. And they wanted to put this video out there to the public so that um, they could see what happened versus it take a week to do all the editing and stuff like that. Um, that's just a guess. I don't. I don't really know why they just put the body cam footage out and didn't have anybody talking and speaking and explaining things. Uh, that's just a guess of mine. As I noted at the beginning of the video, uh, there was nothing wrong with the audio. It's just in buffer mode. So for those who don't know what uh, buffer mode is, um, body cameras do not constantly record like a like a surveillance camera in a store would, right? Um, they are in the on mode, 
but it doesn't mean that they're constantly recording like a video uh, camera would in a convenience store. Think of a camcorder. So you can turn a camcorder on and see the display screen or look through the viewfinder and you know see what the camera is looking at and everything. And it can stay on for, for hours without recording. And this is what most body cameras are like. They are just in on mode, but they're not actively recording anything. The buffer mode, however, is, is technically recording, but it's not making a hard copy recording. It's on a loop. And for this particular camera, it's set up for 30 seconds. So the camera in buffer mode is this continuous loop of recording and deleting for 30 seconds. So it's constantly recording from zero seconds to 30 seconds. And then as it goes to 31 second, uh, whatever that image was at zero second is gone because now there's another image frame that's at the one second mark. Um, and it just keeps, like I said, it just keeps this, this continuous loop cycle of recording and deleting. That way when you hit the event button and start hard copy recording, it includes the last 30 seconds of images onto that hard copy recording. And once you hit that record button, those cameras will keep recording until the battery dies or you fill up the, the hard drive on them. And I forget um, how many hours of recording that one of these body cameras can do, but it's a lot. Um, I can't remember. I don't want to say a number and they'd be wrong, but I want to say it was something like 90 hours or something like that of record time. Like, it's, it's something stupid. <laughs> um, like, there's a lot of space on these cameras, so... Once you hit the record button, that camera is going to record until it runs out of space or the battery dies. And I think that uh, for the most part, the camera is probably going to run out of battery before it does um, data space on there. Unless you've got like a bunch of recordings on there or something like that. Um, but anyway, the uh, the buffer. So it's just a, a constant loop. Basically, it's it's constantly recording and deleting. And when you hit the event button to do the hard copy recording, it includes that 30 seconds before that. And that's what we're seeing right here is the buffer mode. Now, these cameras, at least for Axon, you can configure those differently. Um, you can go as low as 10 seconds and as high as 120 seconds. The default is 30 seconds, and most places don't change that. They just keep it at the 30 seconds because that's a pretty fair balance. Um, once you go to 120 seconds that makes the battery work harder because it's having to compute more and when you think about a shift uh, some agencies do 12 hour shifts and for a camera to last and be on a constant on buffer mode for 12 hours that's a long time for a camera to be on and when they're brand new they might be able to do that but after a year or so the batteries start nine, just like your cell phone. Uh, your cell phone, I can guarantee you, does not uh, hold a charge the same as it does now as it did when you first got it. These cameras are no different. Um, so the older the camera gets, the, the shorter of a, a charge that the battery has, and it's harder for it to um, stay alive during a whole shift. Um, there's a lot of places where officers' body cameras are dying on them during the middle of a shift because batteries have gone out on them. So that 30 second buffer is a kind of a happy medium, I guess you could say. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice balance. You're saving battery power, but you're also uh, having enough buffer time to be able to capture, for most instances, what goes on before the event button is pressed. And most camera manufacturers offer a buffer mode. Any good, reputable um, body camera is going to have some type of buffer mode on it. <clears throat> now, I don't know, we obviously do not know what was going on 
before this 30 second buffer because all we see at the very very beginning of this buffer is the steering wheel and we see him um, going down the street he's obviously he doesn't make any u-turns or anything like that he just comes up behind the guy so um, there's also nothing indicating um, what was transpiring before he gets out on this guy uh, what kind of like clued him into this guy or anything like that I sort of suspect that um, he was driving by him and smelled it and then decided to get turned around and then come up behind him and make the Terry stop um, that's just a suspicion I don't have anything to confirm that but if he would have had um, a buffer time of 120 seconds then we likely would have been able to see that but like I said earlier there's a the, you have, you have a balance uh, you get these cameras set to 120 second buffer mode well then your batteries start dying a lot sooner than you do the cameras that are set to 30 seconds but anyway um, when it comes to you know getting out on people I think the best practice is to go ahead and start the record button before you ever get out of the car. Uh, that way, once you get out and you start to make contact, if they become violent right then and there, well, then you're already recording. You don't have to worry about um, hitting the record button. You go straight to fight mode. So we already obviously know this guy has a gun. He ends up shooting the officer um, here in a little bit. Um, but let's say this officer right now, while this camera is in buffer mode, gets out and this dude turns and starts shooting. And this officer um, retreats back to the rear of his vehicle to put as much cover between him and the threat as possible, gets his gun out, engages in gunfight with this guy. Well, that would more than likely cause this image right here to fall outside that 30 second buffer. And we would lose the images of him shooting at the officer. In this hypothetical scenario that I'm, I'm putting out there. That's why I think it's a it's a better practice to go ahead and activate the camera before you ever get out of the vehicle. That way, in this, say this hypothetical scenario, if he got out and this dude started fighting, if he has his camera on, it's already recording. He doesn't have to worry about trying to remember to hit the record button on his camera. There's some videos you'll see out there where officers, they don't hit the record button uh, right away and you can't hit the record button right away in the middle of a gunfight that's asinine you have to fight your hands should be on your gun and dealing with a threat not reaching up and trying to figure out where your camera's at and turn it on that's the least of your worries right there are, are the cameras nice and be able to capture what goes on absolutely it helps exonerate people 100% um but in the middle of a fight, like you can't, I can't fault anyone for not turning their camera on in the middle of a gunfight. Like that's the least of your fucking worries. You got a dude shooting at you. Uh, you need to be focused on the fight, not trying to be a cameraman. So that's why I think it's it's the best practice to turn the camera and hit the event button and start recording before you ever get out of the vehicle. That way if something pops off, it's already on. You ain't got to worry about trying to turn it on later within that time frame of 30 seconds to make sure that whatever happened was included. It's already recorded. You ain't got to worry about it. So I guess you could say um, this was one thing I didn't like. The fact that he didn't already have his camera recording before he gets out of his vehicle. But he turns it on pretty quick after getting out. I'm going to go to police sport. The reason I'm getting out is your man. We're just doing a little bit of drug addiction in the area. Um, we're just trying to get to know people also. There's a little bit of community policing, okay? Do what? Hey, right, come here. Come here. I can smell marijuana on you. Come here. Oh, you're lying. Come here. You're lying. Come here. Hey, come here. Come here. What are you? So this is typical uh, behavior from people um, who are doing shit they're not supposed to be doing or have stuff on them they're not supposed to have on them. This is typical criminal behavior. Um... Uh, being evasive like this, continuing to walk away, trying to get away from them, um, just arguing, arguing with the police. This is typical criminal behavior. Um, this guy is no stranger to the criminal justice system. 
In fact, this guy has a criminal record. His name is Jaden Jesse, and I think his last name is pronounced Prunty. I don't know. I have not heard it pronounced. That's the only thing I can assume if, of how it's pronounced. His last name is spelled P-R-U-N-T-Y, so I would pronounce it Prunty. Um, it could be Prunty for all I know, but Jaden Jesse Prunty. Um, he's been in for um, aggravated robbery, uh, possession of drug paraphernalia, uh, possession of a Schedule 6 LT4 ounce. I don't know what that is in Arkansas law. It's obviously some kind of drug. And then uh, probation violation for felony. So he's not, he's not a stranger to the criminal justice system by any means. Um, and this is... This is typical behavior out of a lot of criminals, especially ones who are going to be fleeing and evading. Um, he is trying to create distance between him and the officer. Um, he is not fully committed yet to running, um, but he starts to he starts to to commit. At this point, he's trying to size this officer up, trying to get an idea of what he's going to be doing. Um, we'll back this up even more. Um, we're just trying to get to know people also. There's a little bit of community policing, okay? Do what? All right, come here. Come here. I can smell marijuana. Come here. Oh, you're lying. Come here. You're lying. Come here. Hey, come here. Come here. What are you doing? Come here. No, you're making me nervous. So, in my opinion, during this time frame, he was. Um, sizing the officer up, trying to figure out if he could successfully run from this guy. Uh, he's probably also going through his head uh, how he's going to get rid of this gun so he don't get caught with it. He's probably, I, I don't think that at this point he was thinking about shooting this officer. I think he was probably running through his head how he's going to evade this officer and get away. Um... He's acting um, evasive. He's not wanting to stand there and engage in a conversation with the officer. He's wanting to continue to, to walk away from him. And that's, like I said, that's a big red flag. That That's a big indication that the chase is about to be on. Um, when he looks forward, I mean, you can see it's wide open roadway here. There are some houses here he could, you know, try and cut in between. There's a big nice security light on here. It's pretty well illuminate, illuminated. Um, and it's nice. There's not like a whole lot of people around that he can kind of disappear into the crowd or anything like that. So I think he's running the calculation, so to speak, through his head about what he could do to try and get away from this officer. Um, he obviously comes to the conclusion that he's just going to have to run. Sure. What are Come you here, doing? Alvin. Come here. No, you're Come making here. me nervous. Stop. Come here. Down the ground. Stop. You're making me nervous. Stop. Come here. He's not even that good of a runner, which I don't have a whole lot of room to be talking. I'm not the greatest runner either. Um... And that could be one thing that, um, you know, was going through his head that he probably is not going to be able to outrun this officer. Um, we don't get to see the officer very well and see what kind of shapes he's in. Of course, you know, um, officers come in all different shapes and sizes and, and degrees of fitness, some better than others. Um, he could have sized this officer up and thought, shit, there ain't no way I'm going to run from this guy. And he could be thinking in his head what he's going to try to do. Um, ultimately he came to the conclusion of running, did not work out well for him. Officer takes him down. Now, as soon as they go down to the ground, his arms go up under him. Down the ground. Stop! No. Please. Give me your hand. No. Give me your hand. I can't. Give me your hand. I cannot. No, I don't do nothing. Give me your hand. No. So at this point, um, he's, he's obviously resisting arrest. Um, his hands are up under him. I think this would have been a pretty good time to go ahead and deploy a taser on him. Uh, he's not wanting to comply. Uh, once a person has locked their arms up under them, 
it is incredibly difficult to get their those arms out from under them. If you've never had to wrestle someone into a pair of handcuffs, then you have absolutely no idea what the hell I'm talking about. Um, when your arms are drawn in to the core of your body, it is hard to get that leverage to pull those arms out. There have been, I've seen videos of people um, trying to get someone's arms out from under them. And there'll be two people put on their arm and they still can't get that arm to come out. Like it, it is, I don't think, you know, a lot of people I just don't think understand how difficult it is to get someone's arms out from under them with just brute force. It's, it's extremely difficult. So this is where I think the, the utilization of a taser uh, would have been great. Uh, you've already He's already given him the verbal commands. He's already refused them. Okay, you know what? At this point, it's taser time in my opinion. He's a very close proximity. Uh, he could have pulled taser and fired into the back right in here somewhere. Both probes would have been very close to each other. Um, and of course, that would be just like drive stunning. You're not going to achieve an MI with that um, neuromuscular incapacitation. So you would have to take the gun and drive it down into the waistline somewhere. That would lock him up and achieve an MI. At that point, um, he would be able to, with his free left hand, reach up to this arm right here, pull it out from under him. Um, or his right hand, whatever, pull that out from under him because he's not going to be able to control his muscles anymore. He's going to be locked up um, from the taser and at least be able to gain control over that limb and arrest under power. Now, are tasers always effective? No. Is he wearing a jacket? Yes, but it doesn't appear to be a big, thick, poofy jacket. It looks sort of like a fleece sort of looking jacket. I think that um, with the way the fabric is right here, it appears to be, um, um, drawn taut across the back. And I think that, uh, probes would have made a good hit right there and would have penetrated and gone in the skin and then do a follow-up drive stun and complete the circuit. I think that would have been a pretty good choice for him. Uh, but for whatever reason, he chose not to use it. And... Um, you know, if his reasoning was he's by himself and, you know, he can't, uh, articulate that, you know, he'd be able to deploy taser and be able to gain control over both of those limbs. Okay. I can get that. I can see how, um, you know, it, it could be difficult on your own to do a close proximity firing with a follow up and then try to gain control over those limbs because you would have to have constant pressure from the, the, the handle of the taser pressing into the body to make that circuit completed could he have reached down and ripped this up and then cycled the taser and kind of laid it on his back and get connectivity yeah is it going to be 100 percent effective in that way no uh but it, that could be an option so like i said if he could if his reasoning for not using a taser at this point would have been that you know he couldn't achieve good in an mi then I would agree with that because um, it would be a difficult uh, task to perform, but it would still be an option in my opinion. And I think it would have been an option that, you know, could have been used. Have got one fighting? He's starting to lift himself up at this point. Um, and again, that's another reason, like I said, why I think, you know, Taser would have been um, a good tool to be using this guy is not just resisting arrest but he's obviously trying to get back up to get away from him give me a hand no quit you reaching for whatever you're reaching it. for give me your hand <laughs> let go <laughs> let go i promise you if that's a gun it's not gonna end well for you i know i know it's not give me a hand <laughs> give me a hand <laughs> So the suspect fires a gun. Now, 
because the the body camera is so close to him um we don't get to see much of what goes on it doesn't appear as though there is a in cam or in cam in car uh camera from his squad car so we don't get to see from that perspective but we can back it up and we can see from more of this angle um he's kind of in a prone position and he somewhat remains in this position for the for most of the part until the officer rolls off of him but in this position what i think he has done is he has taken his right arm and he's reached down to his waistline and he's got he's got a hold of his gun and i think that um he is trying to pull his gun out and because he has sloppy trigger discipline he's probably got his finger inside the trigger guard he discharges a round and that round hits the officer in the leg now was that an intentional discharge or was that a negligent discharge i don't know and at this point it don't fucking matter if it's negligent or not or intentional um, the fact that he has put his hand on the gun and has now discharged, even though it may have been negligent, it's, it's fight mode at this time. There's no way in this moment the officer could say, oh, well, this guy accidentally shot his gun. There's, there's just no way that anyone could come up with uh, that kind of um, assumption. Uh, the, a reasonable person would have to make the assumption that this dude's trying to kill the officer. And... Um, the officer has to respond accordingly. He now knows this guy has a gun. One, he heard it shot. And then secondly, most importantly, he's felt a bullet enter his body. He's been shot at this point. So he knows damn well this guy has a gun. No. Please. Give me your hand. No. Give me your hand. I can't. Give me your hand. I cannot. No, I can't do hand. nothing. Give me your hand. No. Have you got one? I'm fighting. Give me your hand. No. Quit reaching for whatever you're reaching for. Give me your hand. Let go. Let go. I promise you, if that's a gun, it's not going to end well for you. I know. I know it's not. Give me your hand. <laughs> Now I don't know what that is. That sounds like a that sounds like a giggle to me, like he's laughing. Give me a hand. Now you hear the suspect, he screams ow and fuck. <laughs> that's one thing you know after playing this multiple times that's one thing that kind of makes me think that he made a negligent discharge um but like i said it doesn't matter at this point if he was negligent in firing that gun it no it does not fucking matter whatsoever uh this is a fight this is a deadly fight and the officer, the officer does the right thing. You can also hear that the officer doesn't even have his gun out before that shot fires. After you hear the shot fire, you can hear the officer's gun come out of his holster. And it's a plastic kind of like hollow sounding uh, kind of noise. <laughs> that noise that you hear that like i said it's like a hollow plastic kind of noise uh that is a typical um sound of a gun coming out of a safari land holster a plastic injection molded holster it even sounds pretty similar when you put the gun back in the holster too So at this point, he appears to have dismounted the guy and has come to his side. The 
suspect is turning. So we let's go back to here. So you see his leg right here. So the suspect has gone from a prone position to now he's in a seated position. And he is rotating and turning. His feet are moving that direction. So if he continues with his feet moving that direction, he's going to end up facing this officer. They're going to be um, <laughs> in a 69 kind of position um, at this point. Officer fires one round. Now that first round, no idea where it goes. Second round, it is obvious it goes in the back of the head. This man shot back. That's right. You can hear the gun as he kicks it. Um, he's kicked the gun away from the guy. You can hear that scattering across the ground. I took one round to the leg. <sighs> that noise that you heard when he reholstered. I took one round to the leg. <sighs> so that's the typical sound of a Safari Land holster uh, when there's a gun going in or out of it. It makes this kind of hollowish, plasticky kind of sound. <clears throat> we don't get to see a whole lot because the little blur sensor box is over him. Obviously, this officer being so close to him and firing, he knows he's hit him in the back of the head. Um, for the most part, um, a lot of people don't get back up after being hit in the head, but they can still get back up after being hit in the back of the head. Um, but he can see that this guy is incapacitated, so he goes ahead and holsters his gun. You guys just have one round of yeah. yeah. Of course, this person's <laughs> just happened to roll up at the odd moment, and um, he gets him to, to get on out of there. Now, this is a potential witness. Um, who knows if he ever came back and you know gave any testimony or not, but... Um, that's a potential witness right there who ends up being the same. Simple. So, as I said, most people, when they're shot in the head, they don't get back up. Um, if he would have went ahead and handcuffed this guy, I'd have seen no problem with that whatsoever. Um, it is pretty typical for police to put people in handcuffs after they've been shot and they appear to be incapacitated. That's pretty common. And the reason why that's common is a lot of people, uh, they can get back up after being shot, especially with, with pistol ammunition. Um, a lot of people been shot, they appear to be incapacitated, and they got back up. A lot of people been shot, still awake, they don't appear to be aggressive anymore, they say they surrendered, then their, their tune changes, and now they're aggressive again. There was a famous case out of Miami back in the 80s between the FBI and a couple bank robbers. Um, the bank robbers, they had no drugs in their system whatsoever, and they get into a gunfight with the FBI. One of them takes a round to the head, and it temporarily knocks him out. He wakes back up after a little bit and gets back in the fight. The other guy, he takes a round through the side of his chest at the beginning of the fight. Um, that round, that first round that hits him, lands um, not directly in the middle of his heart, but it, it kind of goes into his heart some. It, it's a lethal hit. He was going to die from that no matter what, but it just did not immediately incapacitate him, and he was able to stay in the fight and continue fighting. Um, he actually ended up killing two FBI agents and seriously wounding others um, while taking more rounds. He took shotgun pellets. He took other rounds. One round went through his uh, forearm. He took multiple rounds. And he still stayed in the fight and caused a lot of damage. 
uh, other people throughout history all across this nation have been shot and they continued to fight. So, and that is pretty typical when you're dealing with pistol ammunition. Pistol ammunition is just not all that great. Um, it still kills, but you have to hit vital stuff. Like you really have to, to aim center mass for the chest and, and perforate the heart uh, to get a person to become incapacitated or hit the T-box. People can still be shot in the head with pistol ammunition and the bullet can actually bounce right off the skull. There's been a lot of people where bullets just basically bounced off their heads. And of course, it still broke skin and everything, but once it hit bone, it just kind of ricocheted off depending on angles and stuff like that. Um, there's been some people who've been shot in the head. The bullet went through the skin, could not penetrate the skull, and it did like a Bugs Bunny thing where it just burrowed under the skin and followed the contour of the skull and then boom, came out the back end under the skin and left a little Bugs Bunny rabbit hole. Um, that happens. And that is why police usually handcuff people after they've been shot. Now, in this, like I said, this case, um, the officer is obviously able to see with a lot more clarity than what we can. Um, he could probably see that he made a pretty square shot right in the back of the guy's head. Um, and then once once he got up and still had his gun trained on the guy, you know, he could see his facial expressions or lack thereof um, and know that there's pretty good chance this dude's not going to get back up and fight again. And so he probably didn't worry about cuffing him at that point. But if he had cuffed him, I'd have no problem with that. <clears throat> because you will also hear later on, you'll hear him breathing. So he's not completely dead. So, uh, sort of mistake number two, I guess you could say, and this is the biggest one of them all. He does not have a tourniquet on him. He has to go back to his car to get a tourniquet. That is probably the biggest glaring problem out of this entire video. And I will harp a lot when it comes to medical stuff. If you're going to be carrying a gun on a daily basis, whether you're paid to do that or you're just a regular person who's concerned about um, self-protection, you carry a gun on a daily basis, even if you don't carry a gun on a daily basis, um, and you have one for home protection or, or whatnot, you should recognize the fact that if you're having to get that gun out, then chances are your opponent has got a gun too. And that can be a gunfight. And in gunfights, bullets go both ways and one of their bullets could hit you so if you're going to carry the tools to induce trauma you need to carry the tools to reduce trauma if you're going to carry a gun on a daily basis you also need to carry medical gear on a daily basis not just for the sole fact that you get into a gunfight bullets come towards you but for the sole fact that there are more instances or occurrences of medical emergencies than there are gunfights for you to be involved in throughout the course of your life. Um, you, the viewer, how many times have you been in a gunfight? How many times have you come across a car accident? How many times have you been at work and someone got hurt and was bleeding? Chances are you've probably encountered some type of medical emergency instead of ever being involved in the gunfight. For those who, you know, answered yes to having been involved in a gunfight before, uh, still, again, you're one gunfight against how many medical emergencies have you most likely came across? You've probably come across a lot more medical emergency kind of stuff than you have, you know, that one gunfight you've been in, or maybe two gunfights, right? 
So it makes a lot more sense to carry medical stuff because you're more likely to be coming across car wrecks or something like that or be involved in a car wreck yourself or be doing chores around the house and some type of medical thing occurs. So um, aside from, like I said, carrying a gun and, and bullets going both ways, you're more likely um, to encounter some type of medical problem uh, that does not involve guns. But uh, you're going to be carrying a gun, then that means you could be involved in a gunfight and bullets come towards you, or someone can stab you. And your first line medical gear needs to be stuff that you carry on you because you cannot always count on or rely on a gun or not a gun, your medical gear being in the car and you being able to get to it. So we can see that his vehicle is a, a little bit of a distance away. Luckily, he's able to actually get up and run to it. What if he took a round a little bit higher into the femoral artery and it also um, shattered his femur bone and he was not able to, to run very well? Um, he, a femur hit, you can bleed out in 90 seconds. Would he have been able to crawl or hobble over to his vehicle within 90 seconds and get that tourniquet and put it on? If he had a very uh, serious injury um, to um, to his bones and to a, to a big artery, I don't know. I mean, that's that's a good question. Um, I think his his chances of getting there in time could be not as high um, as this. Is luckily he's still able to run and put weight on that leg. If you shatter a bone, a bullet shatters bones and stuff. You may not be able to uh, put full weight on that limb and, and run back to the car and get to it. What if uh, the foot pursuit um, lasted a little bit longer? What if this guy was a better runner and he went two blocks, three blocks before tackling this guy and goes down to the ground and he gets shot and he can't put weight on his leg to get back to his car? Well, his car is three fucking blocks away. How's he going to get to that tourniquet in time before he bleeds to death? He's not. That's why it is critical to carry medical gear on you. You cannot rely on putting medical gear in a car and be like, oh, I got medical gear. It's in the car. It's fine. No, you're not always going to be near your car. If you're two blocks away and you've been shot and you're losing blood, you need medical gear right now, not 60, 90 seconds later. You need it now. It is very easy to be able to carry medical gear on you and it not be invasive. At bare minimum, you could put a tourniquet on your duty belt. Bare minimum, you can put one piece of medical gear on you and that could be a tourniquet. It can go somewhere on your duty belt. It can even go in a pocket. If you have an outer vest and you've got a bunch of pouches on there, and there's no policies on, you know, how much stuff you can put on your vest, there's really no reason why you should not have, like, a full bed kit on your vest. For those who don't wear outer vests, or if you do have outer vests, and, you know, it's the uniform style looking kind of outer vest, and it doesn't have a lot of, you know, molly attachments to it or whatever, it just looks like a uniform shirt, obviously, you know, you're not going to be able to put stuff on there. Um, or even if, you know, you still got the concealed vest under you know classic uniform look you can still carry medical gear uh there are medical ankle holsters out there that you can get you can get just an empty medical ankle holster and then fill it up or you can get a preloaded kit from different companies prices vary um when you when you go that option but it's it's an option you you have options it's not like this stuff doesn't exist this stuff exists it's out there and all, all it is is you need to do the research to, to get it. And I have a video on my channel uh, about a medical ankle holster from um, Rescue Essentials, I believe the company name of it is. Um, it was an empty kit, or I'm sorry, an empty holster. Um, and I filled some of the pouches with my own stuff. Um, you can just do a simple search for medical ankle holsters and find a lot of content on that. <clears throat> and if you carry an ankle gun anyway, then 
and you can get away with it and no one notice that you carry an ankle gun, well, you can also carry a medical ankle holster and no one notice it. So, I mean, it's not like you're carrying a whole trauma bag on your on your leg or anything. You're carrying the bare essentials. Uh, a tourniquet, um, compressed gauze, a maybe a pressure bandage, uh, some gloves, nasal pharyngeal airway, duct tape, little stuff like that. You can put in a medical ankle holster, wrap around your leg, and it conceals as just as good as a gun on the other ankle does. If you wear cargo pockets, that's easy. You can put a you know a blowout kit in a in a cargo pocket. It doesn't take up a whole lot of room. But if you're crunched for space or whatever, um, at bare minimum, bare bare minimum, you can still carry a tourniquet on you. Some agencies and companies are nice enough to be able to provide this stuff to their officers and their uh, employees, but um, not everyone has a nice budget. And especially, you know, in the time of defund the police, uh, some agencies don't really have a whole lot of money. Um, and so it's hard for them to, to get that kind of stuff. But if you work for an agency or a company that provides that, great. That's awesome. I love it. I want some more of it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is a lot of agencies and companies just, they don't have that money. They can't afford to give everyone this kind of equipment. And so it's usually left up to the individual officers to buy their own stuff. And that happens more than what you think. Uh, a lot of agencies in this country are poor. They're very small. Um, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but there is a large number of officers out there um, who, who've had to buy their own police equipment to go to work. There's some officers out there who've had to buy their own gun to go be the police. <laughs> There's some who've had to go buy their own ballistic vest because their agency is poor and doesn't have any new ones or can't order a new one to give them. So there's a lot of officers who already know what this struggle is and they've had to be, they've been having to buy their own gear anyway. And so them buying a tourniquet on their own shouldn't be anything new to them as far as buying gear. Um, but that's, that's a reality. That is a reality here in America. Uh, a lot of agencies are poor and a lot of officers have to buy essential things um, that a lot of other agencies can give their own people. Either way, um, it doesn't matter. You know, you come from an agency with a lot of money. You come from an agency with not a whole lot of money. Um, it doesn't cost a whole lot to buy a tourniquet. Um, I mean, if you are hurting so bad that you can't afford a tourniquet then you should probably look at your finances and identify things that you don't need and stop blowing your money on it first line medical gear you gotta have it First line medical gear, in my opinion, is gear that is is reserved for you and only you and or your teammates or family. No one else gets to use your first line medical gear. Your second line medical gear is the stuff that you can keep in your car to supplement what is on you. If you've used a little bit what's on you and you need some more, well, then you get your second line medical gear in your car that you can get. Or for other people... The second line gear can be used on them. First line gear is solely just for you and or your teammates and family. No one else gets to use it. Anyway, that's my spiel on medical. This is what I'm for. So you can see that this has a tech lock attachment on it. This means he could be carrying this on his belt. For whatever reason, he is not carrying it on his belt. But at least he still has it somewhat easily accessible within the cab of his vehicle. And he was able to get it fairly quickly. He wasn't having to uh, rummage around a bunch of stuff and get this thing. 
Uh, We're right in front of Ward. Uh, west of Warren, small spruce. He takes the time to walk back while carrying this tourniquet. I don't know what he ends up doing with the pouch that it came in. Me, I would just drop it on the ground. That's it's useless shit at that point. There's no need to, to try and retain it, put it in the pocket or anything like that. It's a disposable item at this point. Um, and it could be picked up later. So when he takes the tourniquet out, I think he should have just dropped the pouch that it was in and immediately start putting the tourniquet on. Now, in this instance, I don't think that he needed a tourniquet. I don't see a lot of arterial blood coming out. Um, so that's a training issue with, uh, with medical stuff. And usually when I talk about medical stuff, when I talk about the gear, I also talk about training. And so training is also the other important part of medical stuff. You can't just carry medical gear on you and then expect to do well with it, just like you can't take a gun out of the box without ever having any training with it and start carrying it and expect that you're going to be doing good with it. You're not going to be doing that great with it. I can guarantee you that you need to have training just like with medical stuff. You got to have training on it. And this to me kind of shows that, uh, the training for the, uh, tourniquet hasn't been that great because we don't, I don't see any signs that would indicate the need for a tourniquet. I don't see any, uh, bright red arterial blood, you know, squirting out of his leg. I don't even see any blood for that matter. Um, so he don't need to put a tourniquet on. Tourniquets are for stopping like serious bleeds. Like you got a lot of blood coming out. That's what tourniquets are for. It's not because you got a little puncture in your leg. Like that's not what a tourniquet is for at all. Um, at most, what he could have done is put a pressure bandage around the gunshot hole. That would have been suffice. Uh, tourniquet, no. So, um, it also looks like the tourniquet is not what I would call preloaded. Um, you can take your tourniquets, take them out of the packages and stuff, and then get the loop set and have it somewhat tensioned down um, to meet that loop size that you would need to put on your leg or something like that um, without having a visual demonstration of showing you what I'm talking about. It can be kind of hard to talk about it verbally, but uh, you can preset your tourniquets. Uh, that way you're not wasting your time trying to weave it in through the buckles and stuff like that. Towards the heart. 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 Towards see a whole lot of what goes on with the tourniquet. Uh, tourniquets obviously need to be uh, tightened down really hard and the windlass you just keep cranking and cranking and cranking and cranking and cranking and twisting that thing until you really can't twist anymore and I don't know if uh, he has twisted that thing to the extent it needs to be twisted because I don't hear anything that indicates that he's in pain. Um, you know you got a tourniquet on really good <laughs> when um, the patient indicates that it's painful. Well, he's on the ground now. 
that noise that you hear, that that uh, it's kind of sound, almost sounds like a dog. I'm pretty confident that that's him breathing, the suspect breathing. Which direction? Well, he's on the ground now. Yeah. That's a typical sound that you hear from people who are dying. Um, the death breath, I guess you'd call it. Um, it's it's really um, agonal breathing. It sounds, it can sound kind of like snoring in a way. Um, it's just basically um, a person's not breathing at the correct rate that they need to be breathing at, and it's it's it leads to a person dying. So, because this you hear this dude uh, with his last dying breaths. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Uh, not sure if the bullet's still in my leg or not. But, uh. Here. There you go. There you go. You got from again? Okay. Is it stopped? I don't know. It should be. Yeah, you're not pulsing. Come on. That's fine. I'm going to get my pants. You sure? Yeah. I just don't want to be able to get around it. Okay. Yeah, not there. The channel's patch. Not there. Did it come through? Or? I don't think so. I think it's still in there. It's this. It's not very bad. I think it's right now. I would also like to comment about how calm this officer is after having been shot. It's probably something I should have talked about a little bit sooner, um, but he's very calm. Um, I wouldn't say very, very calm, but like when you look at other videos of people being involved in shootings and stuff, like their their breathing rate is super elevated, and they're like yelling, and they're just you can tell they're stressed the hell out. Uh, this guy's, he's hes relatively calm after having been shot um, by another person. And he's like, yeah, I think it's still on my leg. So, um, it's hard to say for sure, but I think this guy has had some, at least some pretty decent training. And um, has done a lot of, if not a whole lot of force on force, then he's done some force on force training and, and really, really took to it and was really able to get himself uh, stress inoculated um, to the extent where when this real thing happened, it didn't like um, send him off the deep end, so to speak. It didn't get him um, too riled up. He was able to stay in the zone and, and deal with the task at hand and, and work through the fact of being shot, fighting for his life, and then applying a tourniquet. So... I, when you see a person acting this calm, uh, that's usually a, a sign that they have been involved in some, some, some okay training. Uh, they've gone through some reality-based training scenarios with force on force and have done, um, you know, have done stuff under stress enough times to where they've become stress inoculated to it and when the real thing happens they're not going berserk they're not yelling on the radio and breathing super heavy and just freaking out like this dude's able to maintain some calmness after being shot so that again like i said that makes me think he's had some decent training or he could have been involved in stuff before for all i know this guy could be a military veteran or something like that and he's been in combat you know this ain't the first time he's been shot at um I don't know. I don't know what this guy's background is. I don't even know what his name is. But his calmness, um, usually, like I said, it kind of makes me think that he's had some decent training before and has excelled well under that training and really took to it. And or that in a combination of experience. He's been involved in very highly stressful things before and things just don't um, uh, stress him out or freak him out like it would someone who's brand new to the job or uh, someone who's less experienced and less trained. Yeah. He's here right there. He's got, he's, I guess he's a positive. Yeah. 
So you'll notice a bunch of people come up to to basically rubberneck and gawk at this officer. Someone comes up and they all <laughs> the, the check out the bullet hole in this guy. Um, you know, it happens. And actually, I just now noticed this, but this officer, he's carrying his tourniquet on his holster. So that is a pretty cool option. That's something I've been seeing. There's a product out there you can get to attach to your uh, Safari Land holster that would put your tourniquet right there to the front. Um, a lot of times you can get the little uh, holder. It would look something um, like a it's Kydex shaped and it would go somewhere on the belt. Um, I don't see within this angle any of them wearing anything like that, but it just, it just popped out to me. I don't think I noticed this. Well, I don't think. I know I didn't notice this earlier when I was watching it. Um, actually, you know what? He has one, too. He has one attached to his gun, but you can tell that he don't have one attached to his gun. Officers coming up and gawking and and rubbernecking. The uh, walking in the middle of the roadway. So you know, you make contact. You call the other man wanting to come from him. Uh, okay. Get crumbs, please. Get crumbs. I don't see any rank insignia on her, but it seems almost like she's someone with rank, someone who would be in charge of stuff. Because she starts issuing out orders, um, and as soon as she comes up and looks at him, this guy starts kind of explaining what was going on. So, although we don't see what kind of rank she is, uh, she's obviously holding some kind of rank uh, or position of authority within them, and she starts issuing orders out to them. Same type. We need to get ambulance to them. I don't know. Just him. It's just him. Just him. Don't touch that. No, 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 no other guy. One guy. Hi. Just him. Just the only place you're here? Man. Do what? Just the only place you're here? Yes. What was that with? So, um, he asked, is this the only place you're hit? Um, at this point, with all these other officers there, what one of them should have started doing is start checking him over to make sure he did not have any additional gun holes in him. Um, sometimes people don't feel the shots going in. Um, actually in a fight, sometimes people don't even hear the gunshots. Um, people who, who, some people who've been shot, they never recognize they've been shot, um, until they start seeing the blood. So, and that can happen when a, a huge adrenaline dump happens. So one of these off, all these many officers here, especially the ones who came up rubbernecking and gawking in his leg, one of them should have started to glove up and pat him down and check for if there's any more blood coming out anywhere, take his vest off start checking his uh, thoracic cavity area, making sure there's no bullet holes there or anything like that. Do a once-over on them. That way, if they did find something, they could start treating it right then and there. Yeah, I uh, just got one to the leg. <laughs> you know, even if the person says, oh, I was only shot in the leg, uh, you should still make them go through a pat-down just to double check and make sure 100% they don't have any other wounds on them. Hey, run that in front of my car. car. Yeah, you want to? Hey, run that in front of my car. Yeah, you want to? Can you walk? Yeah. Right. Here, uh, where you so it seems like instead of waiting for an ambulance, uh, they're going to take him in his vehicle. Okay. 
Drop the tight. And eventually he turns his camera off. Um, and that, that can be pretty typical um, after a shooting. So uh, police officers are citizens, just like uh, anyone else, and they still have the right not to self-incriminate. So uh, he's removed from the scene. There's really no more um, need for the body camera to be turned on. There's no more evidence to be collected visually from his body camera since he's leaving the scene. Um, and he doesn't need to be making statements anyway right now. Um, a shooting, a, not just a shooting, but after a, a use of self-defense, after you've had to fight for your life or be involved in the fight, you have a huge adrenaline dump. And adrenaline is a drug, and you don't want to be making statements under the influence of a drug. Aside from, you know, that obvious thing, um, the, the things that occur to you during a fight, uh, physiologically and psychologically, um, adrenaline has a big effect on that psychologically. You can start to uh, experience um, things like uh, auditory exclusion, time distortion, things like that. Like what, I'm, what I mean by time distortion, I don't mean like no crazy like Star Trek kind of stuff. Um, the details, the vivid details from zero second to a hundred second, like you don't remember exactly all the pieces that went together right after a fight. Um, after your brain has been able to relax and you come down from your adrenaline dump, um, you can start to remember more bits and pieces of what went on and with more clarity. And so making a statement right after a shooting, you, you don't need to be doing that because uh, the, the memory is not going to be the greatest at that point. Um, and still, like I said, you're also under the influence of adrenaline and you may not say something the way that you need to say it. You may say something in a way that can be taken very easily taken out of context or just make you look bad. Um, you know, it could be very conceivable that a person who's who's been involved in a gunfight and had to defend themselves uh, could make a statement like, yeah, I shot that motherfucker. Well, you know, that might not be the greatest way <laughs> to, to, you know, tell other people that you've, you know, you've had to use force or whatever. And if it's in recording, then um, that can be played in court. That can be, you know, put out in public. And, of course, you know, public opinion um, really makes people move. In a lot of cases, and if something like that was to to reach public domain and people could hear the officer, yeah, I shot the motherfucker, uh, that might not be too good for public relations. And um, those grand jury people, when they come across that case and they they hear that, they may decide, well, I think there's something else here. Uh, no, we're not going to do no true bill. We're going to go with something else. So. Um, after you've been removed from the scene or as you're leaving the scene, it is customary to go ahead and turn that camera off. That way, no excited utterances are captured on camera um, that could be used against you. Um, and none of your statements that uh, you're making could be used against you. Because like I said, police officers are citizens, just like any other person. Someone who works for the trash company, someone who works for Walmart, has the same constitutional rights as a police officer. And they have the right not to self-incriminate. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, he has done nothing wrong here. I think he is 100% legal in everything that he did. Um, the guy was shot by a bad guy. Um, he used deadly physical force to protect himself after having been shot by a bad guy. So, he's done everything right. Um, but still, he still has that constitutional right not to self-incriminate. And... Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, when you invoke the fifth or, you know, you don't want to, you know, make statements right then and there, it doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. Uh, it's always best in cases like this, when deadly force has been used to hold off on making comments until you're represented. Because again, like I said, you're under the influence of a drug called adrenaline and you can say some, some stupid stuff under adrenaline and not be thinking about it. Um, if you've ever been involved in a fight before, been involved in a car wreck before, or anything like that, if you could remember you feeling the jittery and your hands were shaking and you kind of have that little jittery kind of voice, and, um, your, your, your mind's racing and everything, um, take that and times it by a lot. And that's what um, 
people could be feeling like after a shooting. And if you could imagine, if you've gone through a a adrenaline dump before, if you magnify that, do you think that would be in your best interest to start making statements that could impact your life 20 years down the road? No, it's not the best time to be making statements like that. So that's why he's turning the camera off and it's pretty customary for agencies to, to turn the cameras off in these instances. That's about it on this video. I don't really have much anything else to say. If you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more Monday quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense, thank you for watching.